Hi there, it's Kevin Winthrop from Oregon Health Science University, Portland, Oregon. I kept saying coming to you virtually from Atlanta because I was thinking about last year, but I don't think ACR was actually in Atlanta this year. So coming to you virtually from wherever it was supposed to be at, but I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon. And I want to do my last couple of broadcasts here. Uh, today, I focus on herpes zoster. It's on the brain, but luckily it's not on the brain of most people taking jack inhibitors. As I've mentioned before, very few of these events, extremely rare to have visceral dissemination of these um, cases. Wanted to highlight some new data, maybe pointing to possible mechanism uh, and a, a new challenge for clinicians in the future. So the anifrolumab data uh, presented by uh, Dr. Joan Merrill, now as part of this uh, abstract abstract 847, highlighted the fact that anifrolumab uh, caused or was associated with herpes zoster in a dose-dependent fashion in phase two and phase three trials. Uh, the, the rate with 300 milligram dosing of anifrolumab was 6.9 per 100 years versus 1.5 in, in the placebo. And we saw somewhat higher doses with 1,000 milligrams in that experience. Uh, what's interesting is this is a uh, type 1 interferon receptor blocker. So we're talking about interferon alpha and beta. We're not talking about interferon gamma. We know interferon gamma is very important for viral control. And we know that type 1 interferons are as well. And this data serves to highlight that. Um, like the JAK inhibitors, which are also producing rates in kind of this range, or maybe even somewhat lower, but depending on uh, where in the world it's being studied, but a similar uh, magnitude of elevation uh, there. And, you know, those JAKs have activity uh, along the axis of the type 1 interferons as well as the type uh, 2 interferons or interferon gamma. So, um, Interesting to me, this is a drug that does not, uh, should not be affecting interferon gamma signaling. So yet we see the same signal. So I think, I think what we're starting to see uh, is that there are multiple ways some of these drugs probably cause herpes zoster. And to highlight some other data along those lines was data presented today uh, in, um, in a live session about hepatocidinib and uh, the risks associated with uh, hepatocidinib one of the risk factors being a history of herpes zoster. And I think I might have mentioned this the other day, but a history of herpes zoster being a risk factor for developing it again uh, it is odd because generally speaking, when you have an episode, it's protective, it builds self-mediated immunity, and you're protected from a second episode in your life. But within the context of the Jack and Hedder programs, uh, we have seen individuals, usually a small percent, three to five percent, who have repeated herpes zoster um, bouts. So there's something special about those people. They're not building their cell media immunity, but maybe it points to, again, the fact that it's not all about cell media immunity. There are other uh, likely mechanisms at play, particularly along the interferon um, receptor pathways that I mentioned before, uh, and potentially other uh, pathways, including you know, modulations of the innate immune system, NK cells, et cetera. Uh, so I want to highlight two more things about this. What are we going to do about it? So obviously, the use of Shingrix in the setting is a moving target. There were two great presentations today. One um, in the session I was in, which was the was um, Dr. Kalmark presented a pre very preliminary study of using Shingrix in a small number of of uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, on JAK inhibitors. And what they saw was that um, actually 25% of these people had absolutely no uh, movement in their um, humoral response to vaccination. Uh, the rest of the group seemed to respond uh, to a uh, normal extent, so similar to what was seen in controls. So what is different about that 25% in their experience that responded uh, not at all? I don't know. And maybe those are the people ultimately at risk for, for zoster. So very intriguing data there. There was um, no increase in flare necessarily noted there, but it was a small uh, immunogenicity study. There was another uh, great study presented uh, by uh, Dr. Um, Tefane Lonfont from uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Lenny and Cassie and Elizabeth Kirshner and crew there uh, were all involved in this. And uh, they looked at 622 people who were vaccinated uh, prospectively. And they looked very closely 
for flare. Uh, and if I remember right, most of these patients had RA, but it was a mixed group. And their use of um, uh, DMARDs was also mixed. And interestingly, they, they found a reasonably high percent of patients uh, having a flare in the first month after vaccination, about 16%, uh, probably higher than what one would expect. And I think the rate was as high as 24% in the RA patients. Uh, these flares were handled with glucocorticoids. I don't think they resulted in anything long-term as a problem, but again, there probably uh, was, was a higher rate of flare associated with the vaccine that we would otherwise uh, expect. Uh, as far as immunogenicity and efficacy, of course, it wasn't measured. Those will be measured in uh, studies to come. So uh, Jeff Curtis and I have several large studies that we're starting looking at Shingrix in both the JAK setting as well as other DMARD setting. I'm sure I'll be contacting you soon to help with the study. <laughs> we're going to need help and help uh, uh, you know, with, with friends and collaborators out there to help enroll these patients and, and find out the answers. Uh, how best to use this vaccine? Because we're going to have to use it. And we got to figure out uh, the best way to do it. So uh, with that, I'll say uh, happy ACR. I got one more broadcast coming to you next. And I think we'll talk about COVID. Cheers.